Okay, welcome everyone again. Uh, our next session is What I Learned Building Fourth in 64 bit Intel Assembly by David Jones. You can hand, please. opportunity to speak to you. Um, thank you for coming. Um, my name is David Jones and I'm here to tell you a little bit about uh, a fourth implementation. Um, before that, I'd like to uh, give thanks to and remember uh, a man called John Pinner. Um, my first public talk was here at PyCon 10 years ago. I have a bag to prove it. Um, John Pinner organised the first PyCon and I met him at the Birmingham Conservatoire uh, 10 years ago. So he's part of the reason why I'm here. Um, and John passed away two years ago in 2015. I'm very pleased that he can carry on his legacy by meeting the Birmingham Conference. Um, so, in the beginning, um, was this rather unwise tweet of mine. And after that, a friend suggested I buy this book on the right, which is uh, Threaded Interpretive Languages by Lilliger, which was written in the 1980s and is about implementing fourth on the Z80 CPU, um, which is an 8 bit CPU, which was very popular in the 80s. Um, so I did. Um, this is what I built so far. Uh, it's called 64th, um, which is obviously a fun on 64th you know, architecture that it works on. And if you search for 64th, you'll, depending on which search engine you use, um, you either end up suggesting you've misspelled the name of a very short musical note, um, or uh, you find somebody else's fourth rank higher than mine. So if you're searching for it, put DRJ11 in, um, and that should find I'm going to stop on GitHub. Those who are really good at typing, there's the URL as well. Um, so let's have a quick look at Forth itself. Uh, it might be a bit tricky because I wasn't anticipating having a split screen. Um, you're optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> generally um, we first have to have already um, computed the numbers we want to deal with. So let's say we want to add 5 and 20. Normally we type 5 plus 20 in like any sensible programming language. <laughs> in fourth, we, we first type 5 and put 5 uh, on what's called the data stack. Then we type 20 and put 20 on what's called the data stack. We add them together, type in plus, and this has added them together. So there are a few things to bear with already. Um, it prints OK after every uh, line of input, where it got to the end of the line. That's sort of the prompt, but that comes at the end of the thing you typed, not at the beginning of the thing you are typing. And it doesn't really like printing much out. If you want to see our result, we have to use the fourth word dot. Um, to show our result, which is 25. And again, notice that's come on the same line as the top. There are words to manipulate. You can add a new line, but I'm not going to introduce any of those. Um, 
So we've seen two fourth words already. Uh, we've got plus and dot. Now in fourth, a word is any name delimited with a space. So you can have anything in there um, as long as it's not a space, because space terminates the word. Um, we're going to use another word now um, called dupe, which is short for duplicate. So if I if I type five, I get five on the stack. Um, if I print it out, five is no longer on the stack. Um, so if I want it back, I'll have to type it in again. Uh, and then I can duplicate it there. So for debugging, um, there's quite a useful word called .s, which prints the stack. Uh, and it prints the stack without destroying it. Um, so we print it now. You see we've got two files in the stack. The stack's printed with the most recent item, the top of the stack, printed to the right, which is the same order you type for me. So if I typed one, two, three, three would end up on top of the stack, and if I print the stack, I now have my two fives followed by one, two, three, with three being on top of the stack. This convention is used by um, quite a lot of fourth documentation. Um, the numbers are a little bit different. Numbers push themselves onto the stack. Words like dot and plus actually do something. There's two uh, different things going on there. Um, we can define new words in fourth. Um, we use a word called colon. Um, I have proposed so that yes, it's really strange that all of these words have like, weird names like dot and colon. If I had to show you more of them, there'd be even more weird names. I guess it's something that was more of a tradition in the 1980s. <laughs> so we define a new word colon. We think of a name for this word. So let's try it. Let's say we want to define a word uh, to square a number. So to square a number, a number that's already on the stack, say, we'll duplicate it using two, and then we can use star. So star takes the top two items on this tag, multiplies them, and puts the result back on the stack. And we terminate the definition with semicolon. Um, so now we can use this um, straight away. We can do five, and then square. Then it's squared on them. And of course, we forgot to print it out. Press dot and get on there. Um, so, notice this definition of square. We haven't had to bother about declaring anything like arguments. There aren't any return values. Square is just a sequence of words that do something, um, and they implicitly will take words, take, they'll take items off the stack, do some computation with them, and generally put them back on the stack. Um, and all of that is completely implicit and there's no actual notation. And this is one of the things that makes fourth both very compact, uh, but also um, a bit inscrutable at times. Um, but by the same token, it also makes it a lot simpler to implement. So <coughs> let's, let's use this definition of square in a new definition. So once we've defined this word square, it appears to the full system just like any other word in the system, like dot or plus, the one that we've already seen. So there's no syntactic distinction between words that have already been defined before and words that have defined themselves. And this leads it to a very sort of uniform syntax. If you want to extend the language, then you're free to do so. And it looks every bit as if that word had already been in the language. Uh, so let's define a word called cube, which will cube a number. So to cube a number, um, which is on the stack, we can duplicate it. So now we have two copies of that number on the stack. We'll square one of those, we'll square the top copy, and then we'll multiply those two together. So this is the same as um, if we have number x, we'll square it, we get x squared, and then we'll compute x times x squared, which is x cubed. And we can even test our, our wonderful 
New Word, typing five to put five on the stack, and then cubing it and printing a result, which is 125. Okay, so that's like a brief introduction <coughs> to um, to the fourth. Let's go back to the slides now. So, oh, editing the slides. Um, so here we've got our definition of cube again. And underneath is a sort of representation of the compiled form of cube. Um, so when we typed it in, the full system compiled cube. And there's actually a mistake in this slide. The way it compiled it was um, there's a cell at the beginning called the code field, followed by um, a bunch of cells where each cell corresponds to a word in the definition. This one here should be. <coughs> and the code field is um, the address of a piece of machine code executed when you call Q. And the rest of the definition is called the body. And in this case, that's a sequence of tokens, each of which corresponds to one of the words that was in the definition of Q. So this is like a really simple way to compile things. Um, Definitions just get compiled into a list of tokens. These tokens are called execution tokens. Let's look, happen, let's look at what happens a bit more closely when we execute a word like cube. So at the top, I've got our definition of square, our definition of cube, and the call to cube that invokes cube here. So putting five in the stack, then we're calling cube. Now let's imagine we're about halfway through this. Cube is called the tube, so it's got two or five items in the stack. It's called square, and square is itself about to call tube, and to put this item five on the stack. When cube calls square, um, there has to be something, there has to be a piece of information for um, square to resume when it finishes and resumes to returns to cube. So when cube equals square, the resumption, the process of executing cube is suspended and we begin the process of executing square. When square completes, um, we have to restart the process of executing cube. And we have to know where in cube to resume that um, process. That's what the return stack is for. And these two items here, cube two, cube plus two, represent like just after the second thing in cube. And square plus one represents just after the second thing in square. So when we call words and forth, um, we deposit on the return stack a stream of uh, return addresses, which is where we're going to resume when the word that we're currently executing finishes. Um, and this is like a completely natural expected way to implement forth. You don't have to implement it like this, but the language um, sort of encourages you to. So to do all this, um, I've implemented a sort of mini fourth VM. Uh, this description is after uh, Conklin and Rather in one of their books. Um, and it's a two-stack fourth VM. Um, so there are four registers. It's really simple. The S and the R uh, register manage the two stacks. S points to a location in memory which is at the top of the data stack. R points to a location in memory which is at the top of the return stack. And I, the instruction pointer, is where in the word that we are executing is the current um, execution token. And W um, is usually any word used at the beginning of an execution of the word, it just points to the word that we're executing. Um, so, if we can implement this, then we can implement four. And we implement this on a computer, which looks a bit like this. Um, if you've ever done a computer architecture course, you probably saw a diagram like this. We have a CPU, um, it has some registers. Importantly, most CPUs can only do interesting things with values in registers. And it's the ALU, which is the arithmetic logic unit, that does those things. The ALU adds things up multiplies. If we want to type in on the keyboard, we have to use an I.O. processor, which generally will put values in memory. And if we want to access memory, we use the memory management unit. 
um, which talks an array of random access memory component here. I'm actually implementing this on Intel 64. Um, and a really simple description of this is we have 16 general purpose registers uh, plus a PC. Each register is 64 bits wide. And the registers conveniently are called RAX, or BX, or CX, or DX, RSP, RSI, or BP, or DI, and RA through R15. Uh, this makes it really easy to remember which. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, so to model um, my fourth VM, I picked some Intel registers here on the right. So S is in RBP, R is in R12, I is in RBX, W is in RDX. And this is a mixture of me being able to remember which registers, the names of registers, and um, which ones avoided the Linux syscall protocol, uh, which of course uses RDI, RSI, RDX, R10, R8, and R9. Um, let's say there are some lessons learned there. <laughs> <laughs> So the fourth system I've built is built in layers. At the core um, is actually quite a small amount of Intel assembly code. Um, around that is threaded code, which is this compiled form that I showed you earlier. And then around that is fourth written in form. Um, now a lot of this, a lot of the code that's threaded code, I would have liked to have written in fourth. And you can write it in fourth. The problem is, until you've written your in, the interpret part of your implementation, you can't write any form. You can write threaded code, um, because the interpreter for threaded code is um, a lot smaller. So let's actually look at some of the code now. So if we look at the assembly, so this is uh, file. Let's look at one of the words we're using earlier. Plus, here we are. Um, these DQs, DQ stands for define quad, so that's what NASM calls an 8 byte constant, 64 bit myself. Um, these are mostly bookkeeping so that the fourth system can find this word by name when it means it. So the actual sort of machine code starts here on this board. Um, it doesn't do much, as you remember, RBP was the register I was using for the stack. So it loads two words from stack into um, Intel registers, RAX and RCX. It adds them up here, so this is like the crucial bit of computation goes on here. Um, and then it deposits the value back on the stack and jumps to this mysterious routine called next. Um, next is part of what's called the inner interpreter, and we're going to have a look at that. This is this is where the inscrutable magic happens. Most of the fourth system is spent in these is it six, seven lines here. Um, so we see a few more of our um, fourth VM registers being used. Um, next is responsible for executing the next instruction in the stream. So it loads that from i, which points to the next instruction in the stream. It increments i here, so that later on i now points to the next instruction to execute. Um, and w is the word we're now going to execute. And we load its code field address, put in i and jump there. Most of the time, in the two words we've just seen, cube and square, that code field address, and this jump here. We go to this routine here, std exe. And this begins the execution of a new um, word before. So this pushes i. So i, if you remember from this here, i is now our, the next word to execute after we've done this one. And we push that to our return stack. and fetch a new stream of instructions from the word we're now currently executing. And if this all seems magic, it is. Um, <laughs> basically, I went around sort of a loop between reading Erliger and implementing ASM until these popped out. Um, but this is the core of the fourth interpreter, and one of the reasons why fourth is so, or was so popular as a language.
Um, there really isn't much more to it than like, this small sequence of instructions here. Um, yeah. Um, so most of fourth, well, this fourth is implemented in fourth itself, uh, like this. So to drop is a word that drops the top two items on the stack, and here's its definition: it just goes drop followed by drop. Um, the reason this is first definition in the file is because I need the data to implement comments. So believe it or not, comments are implemented in fourth itself. Um, and indeed, later on, if you read this, and I'm not going to it, you'll find that loops and if are also all in this file implemented in fourth itself. Um, comments begin with a word called backslash. And so this is a slightly non-portable implementation. Um, 10 is the line feed character in Unix, and this word just knows that it's 10. Um, parse scans the line until it finds the character 10, and then drops everything it found using two um, So this is an example of like, a really simple word defined in four, which is part of the fourth language. Okay, and briefly get back here. So the key implementation ideas here are that words should be reduced to an execution token. An execution token is just an address in memory of the code field. And words consist of a code field followed by a body, and the body is a vector of execution tokens. Um, that's basically everything you need to know to implement for. Um, so Moore's, in the fourth FAQ, um, Charles Moore was said to have discovered this language rather than invented it. And I think his discovery was to find a really small language that was sufficient to do computation and you could implement on your own in a couple of weeks if you were skilled. Uh, and which having implemented, you can then extend using itself. Um, so you can describe any problem you particularly want to work on in the uh, so some random factoids. Who here knows how many Intel 64-bit instructions there are? Yeah, go on, what's your answer? Um, some, I'm not sure, I think it's 1,020-something. Yeah, so I, I made a blog this morning, and it basically said, like, we can't tell if there are, like, six add instructions. Do I count that as one, or do I count that as six? I think I read the same blog. <laughs> so, <laughs> That log says, like, depending on how you count, between 981 and 3683. This fourth implementation is just 24 of those. It's a really tiny number. Um, so I have to wonder what the other like, 3,000 odd are doing. Um, Can you give people five minutes to read between the talks? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll wrap up there. So, uh, further reading, if this is whetted your appetite, uh, I highly recommend Angela McKeel's uh, Euro Python talk on my codes, I think that last year. Uh, these are the things you should search for if you want to find them, rather than URLs, because URLs are far too difficult to type. Um, Lerliger, the book I mentioned, Fourth Programmer's Handbook, um, is the uh, rather uncomfortable the reference I mentioned earlier. And Chuck Moore, the early years, is a reprinted article, um, the creator of the fourth um, wrote, which is really interesting from the perspective of um, insight into his mind and what he was thinking when he created it. All right, thank you very much.